didn't read my review of the Graber Wengro, so I'm going to do that now. And, um, you know, that continues to play out. That continues, that book gets a lot of publicity, and we'll see what the continuing discussion may be. Anyway, this is an anarcho primitivist review as civilization enters its end days. The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity is the grandiose title of David Graeber's and David Wingrow's new book. It aims to undermine the main lines of anthropological thought since Rousseau's Origins of Inequality and Noble Savage theses. Quote, most of human history is irreparably lost to us, not to mention prehistory, which could serve as a warning against selective citations, cherry picking, or making things up as one goes along. There is a pretty clear main thrust to the book as summed up on its last page, to treat as myths such notions as that a time before inequality and political awareness existed, that something happened to change all this, that civilization and complexity, which are put in quotes, I don't know why, are always come at the price of human freedom. Then something that happened was agriculture the turn to domesticated life, and Graeber and Wengrow boldly rescue its good name. Quote, agriculture did not mean the inception of private property, they assert, but that's precisely what that cornerstone of unfreedom and, e and equality did mean. Nothing could be more obvious and established, as their revered Friedrich Engels noted in his Origin of Family, Private Property, and the State. For a book on origins, a book of almost 700 pages, there is surprisingly little on the subject of agriculture. Domestication cannot be found in the index. And per Graeber and Wengrow, agriculture often wasn't that bad. It wasn't a no-exit trip. People were, quote, moving freely in and out of farming throughout most of our species' existence. Far more in accordance with anthropological evidence is the view offered by Charles Foster in his new book, being a human. Farming is like heroin, easier to get out of than easier to get into than out of, says Foster. As many archaeological and anthropolog anthropological studies attest, the boundaries between hunter-gatherer practices, horticulture, and tending the wild, and full-on agriculture are fluid and, and often contested. But the shift to pastoralism and agriculture has been widely understood in recent decades as the main catalyst for division of labor, private property, and their attendant ills. Clearly the underlying objective of the dawn of everything is to affirm that domestication, civilization, and urbanization are good for people on the planet. And part of the job is to cast aspersions on those who lived outside of those dimensions and or to raise doubts as to the facts of their outsider status. In pursuit of these aims, Graeber and Wengrow have played fast and loose with the evidence. Let's look at a couple of examples cited in reviews, and more importantly, by Wengrow in post-publication public discussions. The first is a 1600 BC archaeological site in northeastern Louisiana, now known as Poverty Point. This is described in the book as a hunter-gatherer metropolis the size of a Mesopotamian city-state. But it was neither a metropolis or inhabited by pre-domesticated people. Much scholarship indicates that horticulture was practiced here, and the people gathered here periodically to trade. There is little or no evidence of residential structures, a metropolis with no residents. The book also brings up the case of the Calusa people in southwest coastal Florida, a kingdom, a monarchy of hunter-gatherers. It was indeed a complex, sedentary, stratified society, that subsisted mainly on the bounty of the sea, but there is evidence that they grew papayas and maize. Northwest Coast indigenous groups, often cited as non-egalitarian hunter-gatherers, also domesticated dogs and tobacco. Their potlatch, potlatch, potlatch ceremony existed to counter the accumulation of wealth that led to inequality. Where to draw the line? It seems that any practice or embrace of domestication's control ethos may have a significant social impact. Needless to say, domestication per se does not all, 
always entail great inequality, the dynamic of domestication deserves more study. Grebe and Wingro bring Lawrence Keeley's War Before Civilization to mind. Keeley tried to show how warlike hunter-gatherers often were by citing various primitive folks, almost none of which in, were in fact hunter-gatherers. Tacitus had this to say about Britons who were being absorbed into the Roman Empire. Little by little they were led to things which encouraged vice. Porticos, baths, elegant supper parties, all this in their ignorance they called civilization, when it was only a part of their slavery. Our authors tackle urbanization chiefly by looking at some Ukrainian sites and one Mesoamerican city, largely ignoring what we know about much studied major cities and early civilizations. They conclude that many early large cities showed no sign of centralized rule, no palaces, no major storage facilities, no distinctions of rank or wealth. A new history indeed, one not much bounded by rigor or evidence. Here I think of Stephen Pinker's The Better Angels of Our Nature, which argues that there has never been so little violence in the world. Shredded by critics, the book proceeds by omitting enormous categories of violence. In an age of pandemics, density itself is problematic. Along the road to cities, domestication brought larger and larger population centers. Here was the origin of infectious diseases, as well as many degenerative diseases, tooth decay, a, no a notable example. Plagues could not get a foothold or spread widely among small scattered band societies. In Civilization and its Discontents, Freud pointed out an even deeper disaster, the core meaning of domestication and its impact. It is a wound that never heals, the foundation of neurosis, the engine of unhappiness. One tames or breaks a horse, putting it to work. Humans never get over this. This very radical insight implies that the solution must be an end to domestication, a step Freud shrank from. In a similar vein, Jared Diamond called agriculture, quote, the worst mistake in the history of the human race. Domestication, civilization, cities, an ensemble and a momentum that is increasingly seen as ruinous, even fatal. Grave doubts arise in a world more and more threatened on every level, in every sphere. Joseph Tainer's The Collapse of Complex Societies explain, explain how ever greater complexity takes civilizations past their carrying capacity. The parasite consumes its host and both die. Exactly what we are seeing amidst the pathologies of late civilization. The dominant order, contra Graeber and Wengro, was never healthy and valid, and it sure as hell is not now.